Welcome back. I'm Robert Breaker, and it's good to be back with you preaching on Sunday. I put out a new sermon every week in English and Spanish and a midweek sermon as we're going verse by verse. So three times a week I put a new sermon on YouTube. And I've been on vacation, finally, after three years of not having a, a good vacation. Uh, we took a two-week vacation. We got to see a, a wedding. We got to spend time with some family. So it's good to be back here in this new year of 2018. And I'm excited about being back. I had several people call and say, well, Brother Breaker, um, we missed you. <laughs> we need our weekly Robert Breaker preaching and teaching, so please hurry back. So we're back now, and I decided I wanted to start this uh, year off of 2018 with a bang. And so that's what I'll do today. If you remember last year, uh, the end of the year, I preached a series of sermons on the commandments of God. And we had six different messages on that, on the commandments of God. And I, I kind of wanted to put this message on the end of that, kind of tack it on on the end, because in a way it has to do with the commandments of God. There are some things that God says you shouldn't do because they are abominations. And so what we're going to do today, we're going to look at what God calls abomination. What God calls abomination. Now, some people might say, well, well, shouldn't that be what God calls an abomination? Certainly you can put the indefinite article an in front of abomination, but in Old English, an old uh, so way of saying it is just abomination. So what God calls abomination, or what God calls abominations. I'm going to give you seven different things today that God calls an abomination. We're going to go through the scriptures. And I thought about this message last year, but then Christmas came up. I said, you know, I need to do a message about Christmas again. So I put this off till the beginning of this year, and I thought, you know what, this is going to be the first sermon of 2018. And what I'm going to do today is simply go to the Bible and ask the question, what does the Bible call an abomination? And I'm going to read the scripture. So if you have your Bible there, please, please read along with me. Now I have to say that because... We live in a day and age in which people don't want to hear what the Bible has to say. And sure as the world, as I present this message, someone's going to try to say that I'm giving my opinion. And they're going to try to say, well, this is, this is an opinion piece, and this is you giving your opinion about how certain people live. And I'm sure some people will not like this message. I want to say here from the beginning, I will do my best to not give my opinion. I'm simply going to a book and telling you what the author of that book says and thinks about certain things. So it's not what I'm saying or what I think. It's what the author of this book says and thinks. I want you to remember that. Now, with that stated, it's very hard to talk about an abomination without some sort of reaction. Because something that is an abomination is something that's gross. It's disgusting. It's, 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 it's just... Ugh. And when you think about or when you see an abomination, it's very hard not to become emotional and, 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 and go, Ugh! <laughs> So, as hard as it may be today, I'm going to do my best to not become an emotional person. I'm not going to uh, speak from my emotional reaction against certain things. I'm going to go to the scriptures and say, here's what the Bible says. And here's what the Bible says an, an abomination is. And then it's up to you to decide whether or not that's gross, whether that's disgusting, whether that's something that makes you go, yuck. I think children have it made. Children have it made. When you grow up as a child, you still have a conscience. God gives everyone a conscience. <clears throat> and you have an ability to discern right from wrong. Until someone tries to educate you with higher education and say, oh, that's not wrong. <laughs> But if you just stick with the Bible and stick with just the things that you know from when you grow up, then you can look at things and say, you know, that, that's gross. And so go by your first instinct is what I'm trying to say when it comes to these things. Because a lot of these things that I'm going to present in the Bible today are things that are being pushed by the secular news media, the secular world, by the politicians, and they're trying to push it on us and tell us, no, you have to be tolerant of these certain things. But yet these things are so detestable and wicked and filthy and ungodly that, that just our first instinct is to go, Ugh! when we hear of these things, how can you force something on someone that makes someone go, Ugh! I don't want that. So that's what I want to do today. I just want you to see what the Bible says. You can get upset, you can get angry, but just remember, if you're upset with the message, you're angry and upset with God, not with Robert Breaker. Because I'm not going to present 
what I think. I'm just going to go to the Bible and open the book and say, well, here's what it says here, here's what it says here, here's what it says here, this is what God says here. And so if you don't like what's stated today, you need to realize, take it up with God, the man who wrote it. <laughs> don't take it up with me. I'm just telling you what God says. And that's what a preacher is supposed to do. So this is not hate speech, if you will. However, the very word abomination, <laughs> one of the definitions is hate. So I'm sure many people will say, well, your hate speech and your hateful rhetoric, Robert Breaker. No, 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 no. Don't call me the hater. Don't tell, say that I'm the bigot or the racist or the this or the that. I'm not giving my opinion today. I'm simply going to the scriptures, taking a rational approach and saying, now what does it say? And then you can debate whether you like what it says or not. But at least hear what it has to say. I mean, you're open-minded, right? I mean, you believe in being tolerant, right? right? So be tolerant and just hear what it says. And then if you don't like it, well, then lump it. Forget it. Go on and say, I don't agree with that. But if you do agree with that, then what we need to do is we need to tell people, hey, we need to uh, do what the Bible says. Now, that's what Christians believe. Christians believe, we believe in the Bible, we're going to do what the Bible says. So what I'm going to do is just present to you today what the Bible says about abomination. So we're going to look at today what God calls abomination. I've looked up the word abomination in the Bible, and the word itself, abomination, appears 76 times in 69 verses. So 76 times in 69 verses is the word abomination. All right, that's a lot of abominations. Now the word abominations, in plural, appears 75 times in 73 verses. Now the word abominable, abominable, no not the abominable snowman, <laughs> but the word abominable sh appears or shows up 23 times in 23 verses. So the Bible has much to say about abominations or something that's abominable. If you add it up, it's 174 times in 165 verses, God has something to say about something that he finds abominable, or that he calls an abomination. So we're going to look at that today. Now, thankfully, today we're in the age of grace. <laughs> but even though we're under grace, that's not an excuse to sin. I have a video on YouTube entitled, Grace, Not an Excuse to Sin. So I'm going to read to you from the Webster's Dictionary what an abomination is. Before we do, let's go to Proverbs chapter 15. I want to start in Proverbs 15, verses 8 and 9. Proverbs 15, 8 says, The sacrifice of the wicked is an abomination to the Lord, but the prayer of the upright is his delight. God loves those who are upright, which today would be those who are saved, to pray. And he loves to hear their prayers. Verse 9, The way of the wicked is an abomination unto the Lord. But he loveth him that followeth after righteousness. God wants people to be righteous. God wants people to be moral. But the Bible says that the way of the wicked is abomination. So if a person is sinful and wicked and ungodly, and we'll find out here in a minute, filthy, then that is a person who is abominable. That is an, a person who is following the way of abomination. So we see right from the beginning that abomination is the way of sin, not the way of godliness or righteousness. Now the Webster's 1828 Dictionary defines the word abomination as, number one, extreme hatred or detestation, to detest something. So the word abomination means hatred. Isn't that interesting? So to say something is an abomination, well right there, what do the liberals do? Hate speech, hate speech. And I'm sure that after we look at what the Bible calls an abomination, those people who are liberals and who hate the Bible will say, well then the Bible is a hate book full of hate speech. And that's fine. You are welcome to your opinion if you'd like. But the fact of the matter is, it's what God says about the issue, whether you believe it or not. If you want to argue with God, help yourself. But abomination is detestation. 
The second definition, the object of detestation, a common significance in Scripture, and then he quotes Proverbs 15, 8. That's why I love the Webster's 1828 Dictionary. You can get it online for free. Just type in Webster's 1828 Dictionary and you should find it. But he quotes Scriptures from the King James Bible. The third definition, he says, hence defilement, pollution in a physical sense, or evil doctrines and practices, which are moral defilements. All right, so what is an abomination? An abomination, according to the Bible, abomination is defiling something. What does that mean? It means becoming corrupt. It becoming sinful. Becoming dirty. Very dirty. It says here, it's something that's detestable. It's becoming immoral. So to be abominable is to be immoral, okay? I find that interesting. The last uh, presidential election, the, the, the losing party called the other party and all of his followers deplorable. And uh, this person said, why? I just find the people that want to vote for that guy deplorable. <laughs> what does deplorable mean? It means detestable. It means disgusting. Well, who were the people that that person was speaking against? Why, a majority of them were conservatives. And so what are conservatives? Supposedly, or what used to be, conservatives were those that believed the Bible. So here you have someone that, that's saying the people that believe the Bible are deplorable, or disgusting, or an abomination to me. And when you look at that person, why, that person is the very person that God talks about. That it, It's just interesting. You have to study the Bible because, according to the Bible... There are certain abominations, and yet those people that hate the Bible are the very ones that are guilty of those abominations. We'll get to that in a minute. Now, I looked up the word abominable, and the word abominable in the Webster's 1828 Dictionary means, number one, very hateful, detestable, loathsome. Number two, this word is applicable to whatever is odious to the mind. Now, odious means disgusting. So if something is an abomination, it's something that's utterly disgusting. All right? I want you to think about that. An abomination is something that's disgusting. It's something that is deplorable. Something that you go, oh, I just can't think of that because it's so gross. I don't want to even think about that thing. So this word is applicable to whatsoever is odious, which means disgusting, to the mind, or offensive to the senses. Now notice what it says, it offends. So if something is an abomination, it's offensive. It offends other people. But what is an abomination? Well, according to the Bible, it's something that's unclean. It's defiling. It's something that's immoral. And that is the third definition of, of the Webster's 1828 of the word abominable, unclean. So anything that's an abomination is something that's unclean, deplorable, disgusting, immoral, dirty, sinful, corrupt, defiling. It's hatred. Well, God hates certain things. And what I'm going to do today, I'm going to give you seven different abominations that I found in the Bible. These are things that God hates. You say, what? God hates certain things? Yes, God is pure love. People say all the time, God is love, God is love. Yes, but God does not love sin. And you cannot have love without hate. You cannot love your wife without hating someone who would try to, to steal her from you. You know, you can't have love without hate. You can't love the devil and love God at the same time. If you love God, you hate the devil. If you love God, you hate sin. So love and hate have to go hand in hand. So if God loves purity and righteousness and justice, then he must hate corruption and sin and defilement and immorality. So God is a God of pure love, but God hates some things. And the things that God hates are called abominations. So I'm going to give you what God calls abominations. Again, this isn't my opinion about it. This is just what the Bible says. You can either like it or not. But the Bible teaches that God hates or loathes certain things as they are disgusting, defiling, and unclean to Him, and they are commandments. Like I said, this should go with my sermon series on the commandments of God. This should have been number seven. That's what I had planned. Because God gives in the Bible certain commandments and says, don't do this, don't do that, don't do this, because it's an abomination. What is he saying? He's saying, I'm commanding you, don't do that, because I hate that. That's disgusting to me. Don't do that. 
So God hates certain things, and the Bible tells us what those things are. Now, the first thing I'm going to do today is I'm going to go to the Old Testament law. So a lot of these abominations are written in the Old Testament. So I'm going to read from the Old Testament what God says are abomination. And what we're going to find is what God calls an abomination in the Old Testament, it's still an abomination in the New Testament. Exception one. There's going to be one exception in which the final one I'm going to talk to, to where there was something that God said back in the Old Testament was an abomination, but today it's not. But all these other things, there's no other place in the New Testament where God says, and, and now you can do those. It's not there. So if there is something that God hates in the Old Testament, He still hates it in the New Testament. Unless He says something different in the New Testament, which He does in one case. And we'll get to that. So let's go and let's look at this. Bible tells us, what God hates. And you know, if you love somebody, you love what they love and you hate what they hate. There are certain things that people just don't like. And if you love those people, then you remember that. And you try to please them. For example, let's say you're married to a wife and she doesn't like shrimp. Okay? Kind of like my wife. <laughs> she doesn't like shrimp. Well, what do I do? Would I, do I force feed her shrimp? Or do I say, honey, I know you don't like shrimp. How about we get you something else? What would you like? Oh, a chicken sandwich? Okay, let's get You know, you think about what do people like and what don't they like. And if you love them, you don't want to be an abomination to them. You don't want to uh, give them or do for them things that they don't like. You want to do what they like. Well, there are some things that God says he doesn't like. They are disgusting to him. They are defiling. They are unclean. Leviticus 18.26 Ye shall therefore keep my statutes and my judgments, this is God speaking in the Old Testament of the law, and shall not commit any of these abominations. What abominations? Well, I'm going to read you some of them here in a minute. He gives you a list of things that God says are an abomination. He says, you shall not commit any of these abominations. Okay, so that's some of the, that goes with the commandments of God. This is a commandment of God in the Old Testament. Don't do these certain things. Neither uh, any of your own nation nor any stranger that sojourn, sojourneth among you. So God says, these are my statutes, these are my judgments, these are my commandments, these are the things that I tell you, Israel, under the law, that you need to do. And these things that he mentioned that he calls abominations, don't do those things. Don't do things that are disgusting and defiling and sinful and dirty and immoral. Be a clean, righteous people. That's what God is saying in the Old Testament. Now, Leviticus 18.29, it says, For whosoever shall commit any of these abominations, even the souls of that commit them shall be cut off from among their people. So there was a hefty fine, if you will, that had to be paid if you committed an abomination. And what was that? Well, God says he cut your soul off from among your people. God says, basically, you're not saved, and you can't be saved, and you will go to hell if you commit these certain things. Now, remember, that's Old Testament, all right? I'm not over here yet in the New Testament. But in the Old Testament, if you committed any one of these abominations, that was it. There was no salvation for you. You were cut off from among your people. You were cut off from the law. You were cut off from the temple to where you could take a sacrifice for forgiveness. You see, there was no forgiveness for these sins. Matter of fact, many of these abominations carried with them the death penalty. If you did these things, you were to be stoned to death. Wow. Wow, so there were some things that God hated so much that he didn't even offer salvation for. How different is the New Testament? Thank God for the New Testament because the Bible says the blood of Jesus Christ forgives of all sins. Thank God for that. Amen. There's not some sin that we can do today where God goes, okay, you're not going to find any forgiveness whatsoever for that. No, thank God today there's forgiveness for all sins. Praise God for that. Well, let's go to Leviticus 18 and verse 30. Therefore shall ye keep mine ordinance. What's an ordinance? It's a commandment. That ye commit not any one of these abominable customs. Which are these abominable customs? Well, in, in verse um, 20 through 4, they were the things that were done in the other nations. And he says the other nations are defiled because of those things. Because they were doing dirty, immoral things that were disgusting and unclean. God says, I don't want that. So he says in verse 30, Keep mine ordinance, that ye commit not any one of these abominable customs, which were committed before you, that ye defile not yourselves therein. I am the Lord your God. So the Bible tells us that when you commit an abomination, you defile yourself. Did I write that up here? Yeah, defiling. So you defile yourself. You become unclean when you commit an abomination. What does God want? He wants us to be clean. 
Now let's go to Deuteronomy 18, uh, 9 first, and then we'll go to Deuteronomy 20. Deuteronomy 18, 9. This is a, a verse that I wanted to read. Deuteronomy 18, 9 says, When thou art come into the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee, thou shalt not learn to do after the abomination of those nations. So God says, do not learn to do abominations. You see, abominations aren't just something that somebody does. They're taught. And unfortunately, we live in a day and age where people teach other people, hey, you want to do something fun? Come over here and let's do this together. And what they're doing is something that's dirty and immoral. And it does affect society. You say, preachers have no right to preach on that. Oh, really? Well, what are we supposed to do as preachers? We're supposed to tell people the way of righteousness, the way of doing right. We're supposed to have a moral society. If you get rid of all the preachers, then you have an immoral society, and society crumbles and falls. Is that what you want? You want a society that crumbles? History teaches that when society crumbles, it's not a good thing. There's wars, there's rapes, there's murders, there's stealing, there's lying, there's cheating. Who wants to live in a world like that? Don't you want to live in a world of justice and righteousness? Well, then go to the Bible. Well, Deuteronomy chapter 20, verse 18 says, Deuteronomy 20, 18, And they teach you not to do after their abominations, which they have done unto their gods. Okay, so committing an abomination is connected with worshiping false gods. And I'm going to get into that here in a minute. What is a false god? Well, it's a devil or, or a demon. But it says here that you should not do their abominations, which they have done unto their gods, so ye sin against the Lord your God. So the Bible tells us that if a person commits an abomination, that's a sin. So, sinful. What is it? It's a sin. To commit abomination is to sin. Well, there you go. I have every right in the world, then, to preach on this subject. And it's not hate speech. It's Bible. Because a preacher is supposed to preach against sin. There's a lot of people out there today that are sinning, and they don't want to hear that what they're doing is sin, unfortunately. But it is. Deuteronomy 29.17. We're going to look at these things that are abomination. I'm going to give you seven of them. But let me show you this first, because we just read a verse about God saying, don't do what the nations do, the heathen do, and don't worship devils. And in Deuteronomy 29, 17, we read, And ye have seen their abominations, and their idols, wood and stone, silver and gold, which were among them. So, one of the things that's an abomination to God is idol worship. Worshiping idols, or worshiping devils. Let me, I'm going to show you some more verses. But I'll go ahead and write up here. One of the things that's an abomination is idols. Idol worship. Which, by the way, is worshiping of devils or demons. And you know, it's funny. People say, well, we don't worship idols today. Yeah, but you go to TV and there's a thing called American Idol. <laughs> I'm just saying. <laughs> it's interesting. Well, I don't worship an idol. Yeah, but you make idols out of country singers and out of rock and roll singers and out of hip-hop singers, and they become your idols, and you make idols out of movie stars, which are some of the worst people in the world, filthy people, dirty people. So Deuteronomy 29.17, God says, look, it's an abomination to worship idols. Now go to Deuteronomy 32.16. De Deuteronomy 32.16 says, I'm in 33 here, Deuteronomy 32.16 says, they provoked him to jealousy. Who? God, the rock of their salvation, verse 15. They provoked him, God, to jealousy with strange gods, with abominations provoked they him to anger. So God was angry with the people of Israel because they worshiped false gods. Now what does it say in verse 17? They sacrificed unto devils. They sacrificed unto devils. So what is idol worship? It's connected with the sacrificing to devils. It's, it's connected to the worship of demons. And that, of course, would be something that God calls an abomination. Do you have idols? Do you worship idols? I hope not. In the New Testament, in 1 Corinthians 10.20 and Revelation 9.20, it talks about people sacrificing to devils, worshiping idols, and how that's evil. So one of the things, the first thing that I want to say that's an abomination is that God hates idol worshiping or the worship of devils. Now in the Bible they usually built their idols in groves. And they went together and away from God and they hid in these groves which are big forests and that's where they worshiped their idols and oftentimes that's where they practiced their sexual sins. 
So there is a sexual thing going on, a sexual deviance, if you will, taking place. And it all starts with idol worship. You say, oh, it's not bad if I have a little statue in my house and I pray to it every now and then. Well, you're going down the road towards abomination, losing your soul, the way of uncleanliness and morality and evil and wickedness. So God hates idols. God is disgusted with such a thing. That's the first thing I want to say that God calls an abomination. Now, that's not my opinion. I've shown you the verses that God says it's an abomination to worship a false god, another god than God himself. So worshiping another god and making, well, that almost sounds like Exodus chapter 20, one of the Ten Commandments. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. Amen? So it all ties in together with the commandments of God. Now, the second thing, we're going to go all the way over to 2 Chronicles for this one. We need to go to 2 Chronicles chapter 28. The second thing that God calls an abomination, 2 Chronicles 28.3, is killing your children. And this is all connected with devil worship. And people that worship devils, they do what's called human sacrifice. So the second thing is 2 Chronicles 28.3. Now, what happened is the people of Israel did not obey God. And they did learn from the heathen how to do the evil practices that the, the heathens did. And what did the heathen do? Why, well, they killed their own children as an act of worship to false gods. Here it is in 2 Chronicles chapter 28 and verse 3. Moreover, he burnt incense in the valley of the son of Hinnom and burnt his children in the fire after the abominations of the heathen whom the Lord hath cast out before the children of Israel. Israel. Now go back to Leviticus 28.1. You see, when people begin to commit idolatry, commit, that is turning from God, and when they begin to turn from God, they begin to turn to worship false idols, and false idols demand human sacrifice. False gods want you to kill your children. Now that's an abomination. What if I told you, go kill your kid? You'd go, oh, no, oh. You see how an abomination is something that makes you go, ooh, yeah, yuck. An abomination is something that's so awful that you don't even want to think about it. You don't even want to think about doing such a horrible act. And yet, that's what they did. People that committed this abomination. Leviticus 18.21 And thou shalt not let any of thy seed pass through the fire to Moloch, or Molech, neither shalt thou profane the name of the, thy God, I am the Lord. But yet, that's what they did. They committed Murder, basically. They killed their own children. So what is this one? This is human sacrifice. And we're living in a day and age in which human sacrifice is on the rise. Kids are kidnapped every day. And they are, they are killed by Satanists and devil worshipers. And that's a sad thing. But if you think about it, who is killed the most in the world today? Children under the act of abortion. When an abortion takes place, that's killing a child. Oh, they try to justify it and say, no, no, it's just a, it's just a fetus. Doesn't matter. The Bible says it's a child. There's a verse in the Bible that says if a man is to punch his, his, uh, a woman in the belly and the baby dies, then that man should die. Eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth. What is the Bible saying? That that's a life, and to kill a child in abortion is to take a life, and that's murder. What is that? That's an abomination. You say, you wouldn't take that kid as soon as he's delivered, and as soon as he comes out, that little child, you wouldn't grab him by the legs and boom, hit him up against the wall and bash his brains all out, would you? No, that'd be murder. But if that very same doctor kills the kid while he's inside the womb, well, the government says, no, that's fine. No, that's an abomination. You're a murderer. That's sick. That's disgusting. And that's what the Bible says an abomination. Now, it's an abomination to kill children. Again, not my opinion. I'm just reading the scriptures, and God says it's an abomination to kill your kids. Now, it was connected with sacrificing them to false gods. You say, well, abortion isn't sacrificing the false gods. Well, is it, or is it not? You see, there's a big movement in the world today in many colleges of uh, communism and Luciferianism. And there's a lot of young women that go to college to get pregnant, and, and they're taught, well, if you want to get ahead in this world, well, you have to sell your soul to Satan. And if you sell your soul to Satan, well, he demands, guess what? Human sacrifice. So why don't you just go get an abortion 
And Satan will be pleased with that, and he will count that as a human sacrifice. What are they doing? They're killing their kids. One of the worst things I ever saw on the internet was this, this woman who was a communist. And they asked her, what do you think about abortion? She said, I kill my kids. Oh, I kill my kids. And you just look at that and you just go, oh, oh. Oh, poor children. Poor ch Who wants to kill kids? That's so sad. So sad, indeed. So that's the second thing that the Bible calls an abomination. The first thing was worshiping idols, worshiping false gods, which is really worshiping demons. The second thing the Bible calls an abomination is human sacrifice, killing kids, killing children. The third thing the Bible calls an abomination we find in 2 Kings 23. And I hope that people that are listening to this aren't guilty of any of these abominations, amen? If you are, well, you'll probably click off and go watch something else, and that's fine. But don't you think you should be a little bit tolerant? Don't you think you should have an open mind, at least see what they all are? <laughs> oh, no, no, no. I mean, I thought you pride yourself on how tolerant you are. Okay, then why don't you tolerate just a little bit more, just to find out what the Bible says? You know, it's your life. You can choose to follow the Bible or not. Why don't you have a little bit of a, you know, a little tolerant mind there and, and listen to at least what the, the rest of the Bible says. The third thing that I want to say is an abomination is in 2 Kings 23-24. And in 2 Kings 23-24 we read, Moreover, the workers with familiar spirits. Now what's a familiar spirit? It's a demon. It's a demon. The workers with familiar spirits and the wizards and the images and the idols and all the abominations that were spied in the land of Judah and Jerusalem did Josiah put away that he might perform the words of the law which were written in the book of Hilkiah, the priest found in the house of the Lord. So here is working with familiar spirits or being a wizard. What is this? This is witchcraft. Do you know what the Bible calls an abomination? Witchcraft. What is witchcraft? Why, it's, it's, it's wizardry. <laughs> it's wiz why it's Harry Potter. <laughs> you ever heard of Harry Potter? Why, that's really big in the world today, Harry Potter. And this woman wrote all these books, and, and they want your children to read these books about how to be a wizard and do witchcraft. Even though it's an abomination in the Bible. You see? Do you see where I'm coming from? The Bible says this, but the world says, no, we want the opposite. We want to do the abominations. We want to be unclean. We want to be immoral. We want to be deplorable, disgusting, and nasty. We don't want to be clean, because being clean means we'd have to give up all this stuff. Hmm, interesting. So that's magic, witchcraft, wizardry, abomination is dealing with witchcraft. And they say today that witchcraft is on the, on the rise. They sell little Ouija boards in stores, and, and children experiment with how to do spells. And it's all over, and more and more kids are looking to that. Well, it's the road of destruction. It's not the way of salvation. Demons uh, hate you, and they don't love you. And all they want is to abuse you. I've talked to people. I've talked to so many people that used to deal in witchcraft, used to deal with demons. And they tell me the demons torment them night after night as they lay in their bed and mock them and make fun of them and put thoughts of suicide in their head. They delight in torturing people. You see, this isn't something good. You see, God tells you not to do these things not because He's a God of hate and He hates you. God loves you and doesn't want to see you get hurt. That's why He's warning you, don't do these things because they lead to destruction and they will hurt you. Demons will eat you up. They'll gobble you up. They hate you. Devils hate you. Well, now let's go to Proverbs chapter 11, and I'm going to read you another one. I'm trying to get through this quickly. A lot of people ask me, Brother Breaker, could you do a little bit faster your sermons? Well, I'll do the best I can, amen? It's, it's all about having a lot to say, amen? So Proverbs chapter 11 and verse 1. A false balance is an abomination, is abomination to the Lord, but a just weight is his delight. God hates a false balance. Let's go to Proverbs chapter 20 and verse 10. What are you saying? What does that mean? What is a balance? Well, in the old day, the way they measured things in the old day, they didn't have a little digital scale and you just put something on there and read the numbers. They had a balance. And so you put something over on this side, and then you'd have to put the money over here, and when it was equal, then that's what you paid for the price of something. And that's how they worked. Well, a false balance is an abomination to the Lord. What does that mean? That means there were people that cheated. 
they made fake uh, things that weren't the actual amount so that it would weigh less so they would pay less. But Proverbs chapter 20 verse 10 God says diverse weights and diverse me measures both of them are alike abomination to the Lord. God says I hate someone that doesn't have a standard. If you're going to go buy something you have to go by the weight and you pay by the pound. But there are people that will lie and they'll fix the scale to where it weighs more so you actually pay more than what it's worth. And God says, I hate that. That's an abomination. Why does God hate that? Why does he call it abomination? Because it's stealing. You're stealing people's money. You're not taking it correctly. Go to Proverbs chapter 12, verse 44. It's actually, it's lying. <laughs> it's lying. Proverbs chapter 12, verse uh, 22 Proverbs 12, 22 says, Lying lips are abomination to the Lord, but they that deal truly are his delight. So God hates people that do bad deals, that deceive people, that, that lie and trick people to get their money. God hates that. And God wants people to not lie. Proverbs chapter 17, verse 15. Here's another one. Another thing God hates is exalting the wicked and condemning the just. Proverbs 17, 15 says, He that justifieth the wicked, and he that condemneth the just, even they both are abomination to the Lord. What is that? That's saying someone that's guilty of a crime, you say, oh, they haven't done anything wrong. And someone that hasn't done anything wrong, all you do is attack them and put them down and say, well, he did this, he did that, he did this. God says, that's an abomination to me. I hate it when the wicked prosper and the righteous suffer. That's something that God hates. Let's go to Proverbs chapter 29. But yet we see that in the world today. I've met many people in jail. I preach in jails. I've met many people in jail. I ask them, what happened? What would you do? They tell me the story. And it doesn't sound like they're guilty of anything. And yet I've met many people uh, that have done just horrible crimes. I say, well, did you ever go to jail? They go, no, I got away with it. <laughs> That's wrong. That's not justice. God hates perversion of justice. Proverbs 29, 27. An unjust man is an abomination to the just, and he that is upright in the way is an abomination to the wicked. Yeah, that's about the world we live in today. It seems like those that are doing evil get away with it, and those that are trying to do right, they suffer. Doesn't it seem like that? I mean, isn't that just a horrible thing? But that's the world we live in. Go to Proverbs chapter 6 and verse 16 through 19. Proverbs 6, 16 through 19 says, These six things does the Lord hate, yea, seven are an abomination unto him. These are things that God hates. These are an abomination to God, these seven things. Verse 17, a proud look. Someone that's prideful and looks down on you like, I'm so much better than you. God says, I hate that. I hate that. It says, and hands that shed innocent blood. God hates it when someone murders an innocent person. Kind of like, People killing their kids. That kid hadn't done anything. It says in verse 18, An heart that deviseth wicked imaginations. God hates it when people just sit around and think just wicked, evil things. Why? Because they're with their disgusting, sinful, corrupt, and defiled minds, they think bad things. Feet that are swift and running to mischief. God doesn't like people running to sin, and yet a lot of people do. Verse 9, A false witness that speaketh lies, and he that soweth discord among the brethren. So these are things that God says are abomination. So what is that? Well, being corrupt. God hates corruption. And yet we live in a world where there's corruption everywhere. I mean everywhere. You can't go to Washington, D.C. without seeing corruption. <laughs> I think the reason that a certain person won this last election is because people were fed up with the corruption that they saw in Washington, D.C. You see, God says that a corruption is an abomination to him. Immorality, being immoral. God doesn't want you to be immoral. God hates lying. God hates it. A thief when people steal from others. So but what is what is this one? What is the number four here? Number four abomination is living an immoral life in which you are a corrupt person and you are corrupt and you're using your position or your authority or whoever or what you are to steal and lie from other people. What does that sound like to you? You know, they say that the, the, the most immoral people in the world are car salesmen, politicians, and, and lawyers. And lawyers usually get into to, to, to politics. I guess car salesmen do too, usually. 
And why is that? Well, because they lie, they steal, they cheat, they do whatever they can to connive. And those are things that God hates. God wants people to be moral. So being immoral is an abomination to God. God wants you to be moral. What does he want you to be? Honest. Basically, what God wants is for you to be an honest person. And anyone who's dishonest is an abomination unto God. That's what the Bible says. Now let's go to Deuteronomy chapter 22. And I want to read you another thing. Now, these have all been things that God looks down from heaven and doesn't like. But I'm going to show you some more things. And uh, this one has to do with how someone acts outwardly. And you see, these things, they can hide, they can cover up. But this one you can't really cover up. This is, this is outwardly manifesting what is inside of you. That's what this abomination is. And these next two are, as a matter of fact. Deuteronomy chapter 22 and verse 5 is a verse that very few Christians ever, ever read. Very few preachers ever preach on. Yet it's in the Bible. And it has to do with Reversing the gender roles, or as they love to call it today, transgender. <laughs> In Deuteronomy chapter 22 and verse 5, the Bible says, The woman shall not wear that which pertaineth unto a man, neither shall a man put on a woman's garment, for all that do so are abomination unto the Lord thy God. God says, it's an abomination. I hate it. It's gross. I look at it and it's disgusting to me. To see a man dressed like a woman, and to see a woman dressed like a man. God says, I just don't like that. That's just, to me, that's wrong. What does that do? That's gender mixing, if you will. That's saying, no, there's no such thing as man and woman. It's okay that they're both the same, and that they dress the same, and they're all alike. And, and who cares? Well, God does. You see, God made man, and he made woman, and he made them different for a purpose. So that they can only be fulfilled by being together in marriage. Well, what does the world do? The world says, forget God. I mean, we're going against God anyway. <laughs> we might as well go all the way against God. Well, let's just break up the family unit and let's destroy society and let's just let men decide, you know, one day, you know what, I want to be a woman. And let's just let women decide one day, you know what, one day I'm just going to be a man. And now let's just mix the genders. Well, that's not what God says. That's going against God in the Bible. Go to 1 Corinthians chapter 6. Do you realize that according to the Bible there is a sin that very few people preached on? Matter of fact, I don't think I've ever heard a minister preach on the sin of being effeminate. Except one. I think I do remember one. Yeah, I do have a tape of a, of a preacher preaching on the sin of being effeminate. But in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 9 through 11, look what it says. Know ye not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God? Be not deceived, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, well, fornicators, adulterers, adulterers, nor effeminate, nor abusers of themselves with mankind. It starts with idol worship. That's when you turn away from God. When you turn away from God, the only alternative is turn to Satan, turn to devils, turn to familiar spirits or demons. And it says, effeminate. The Bible says, don't be effeminate. If you're a man, be a man. If you're a woman, be a woman. Verse 10 says, neither thieves, why well, there, there it is there, don't be corrupt, don't lie, don't steal, uh, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners shall inherit the kingdom of God. Now, to people that are saved, he says, and such were some of you, but you're washed, but you're sanctified, but you're justified in the name of the Lord Jesus by the Spirit of our God. So let's don't be effeminate. God doesn't want men acting like women and women acting like men. Yet today, what do you hear? All over the news. You know, well, uh, men have a right to go in a girl's bathroom and girls have a right to go in a men's bathroom. And if a man decides he wants to wear a dress and be like a woman, okay, and, and stuff like that. And it's all over the news. And all, what do they do? They say, well, we believe in, in rights for the transgender. And, you know, no longer is it just man and woman. Today, there's 26 different genders. What is this? Oh, I know. It's people turning against God. Duh. <laughs> That's easy to see. They hate God, so they just go against anything that God loves, and they want to do what God hates. Oh, now it makes sense. Because it sure doesn't make sense any other way. When I was 18 years old, I moved back home to Florida. Saw an old friend of mine, and... 
he was in his last year of high school and he invited me to go to uh, something at his high school. And I said, well, what is it? He says, well, they're having a um, transvestite contest. And I said, a what? He says, yeah, a couple of guys are dressing up like girls and then people are going to vote on which one's the prettiest. And I thought to myself, Ugh! I mean, that was the first thought I had was, Ugh! why did I think that? Because an abomination is something that's gross. It's gross to me. That was gross. I don't know why I went, but I went and I sat there and I watched and my friend won. Out of like eight or nine boys, he was the most beautiful dressed as a girl. So they voted on him as the queen, I guess, the prince. I don't know what to... And I just thought, man, that's... Ugh, boom, yuck. And I told him after, I said, that's disgusting, bro. He goes, ah, oh, yeah, whatever. It wasn't that important to him. But to me, no thanks. No thanks. It's personally, I don't want that. Because that is something that to me is gross. And yes, that's my opinion. I don't want to give my opinion, but I, if you want to know, that's what I think. But what does God think? What does God say? God says, don't do it. Don't dress up as a woman if you're a man. Well, he did it. Don't dress up as a man if you're a woman. That's just what God says. Like I say, you don't have to follow God. You can go to hell if you want to. I mean, you can disobey. That's up to you. <laughs> but up to me is, what do I do? Well, I'm a Christian, so I want to serve God. I want to follow the Bible. And the Bible says this, that, and the other. Well, uh, so for me, that's not something I'm going to do. To me, it's, it's, it's just like, bleh. Well, let's go to the next one here. Let's go to Leviticus again. Now, what we're going to find is all these things lead to things that are not only gross, and your first instinct is, eh, but they lead to things that are so disgusting, so wicked, so vile, so sinful, so dirty, that you're more than just, yeah, you're like, Wah! and you're almost to the point of wanting to vomit. Because that's what abominations lead to. Utter, complete depravity to where people are doing things that are so disgusting, it makes moral people want to vomit. Matter of fact, the Bible uses the term vomit. What is this? This is sexual sins. Sins. Or sexual deviance, I guess we could call it. Uh, sexual perversion, I guess we could call it. But in the Bible, there are certain things that are sexual sins. And God says that these sexual sins are an abomination to him. Leviticus chapter 18, verse 20. Moreover, thou shalt not lie carnally with thy neighbor's wife to devile thyself with her. What is that? That's adultery. God says adultery is wrong. It shouldn't happen. It shouldn't take place. Verse 22. Thou shalt not lie with mankind as with womankind. It is abomination. What is lying with mankind as with womankind. Why, it's a man doing a sexual act with another man, what we call sodomy or Sodom. It comes from Sodom, which we know what happened to Sodom and Gomorrah. God judged that sin and he destroyed it. And what is it? It's, it's a man and another man engaging in sexual activity. Now, how is that even possible? And they don't fit. God made the man and the woman to come together as one and they fit. But a man and a man don't fit, and a woman and a woman don't fit. Well, they found ways for them to reach their own gratification. And I will not go into what they do in the act of sodomy, but needless to say, it is disgusting. It is dirty. When they get done, they're covered in feces. What is feces? It's waste. It's gross. It's disgusting. So when people engage in this act of sodomy, I look at that and I just go, Ugh, I, I want to vomit because I don't want to smear feces or, or poop all over myself. And yet that's what that sin does. And so to me it's disgusting, utterly disgusting. But it doesn't stop there. Leviticus 18.23 Neither shalt thou lie with any beast to defile thyself therewith. Neither shall any woman stand before a beast to lie down there too. It is confusion. Now we have the sin of bestiality. And God says bestiality is an abomination. What is bestiality? A man having sex with an animal or a woman having sex with a beast. Now, what is your first thought when I say that? If you're normal, if you're a moral person, it's bleh, yuck, disgusting. I told this before, I think, but when I was in high school, they had the, 
is it the 4-H club or the, I can't remember, but the, the Farmers, Future Farmers of America, FFA, I think it was. And I wasn't a part of that, but um, in the school there was a young man there that, that had some uh, pigs. He took care of those pigs. He'd come in every day early in, into school to his little pen and take care of his pigs. And one day they caught that young man doing something with a pig that he should not have done. Now, I'm not going to go any further than that. But it was bestiality. It was, and, and it was spread like wildfire to the whole school. And you'd walk down the hall and people say, Hey, did you hear what so-and-so did with that pig? <laughs> and it was just interesting to see what people thought about it. And everybody that, that you talk about, you say, He did what? It was, it was, it was, huh? What? Huh? It was, it was, it was, that's disgusting. That, that's, ugh, gross. That's what they thought. Why? Because that's something that you shouldn't do. It's a sexual sin, and it's right there in the context of sodomy in the Bible. It's an abomination according to the Bible. Look at verse 24. Defile not ye yourselves in any of these things. Well, if you commit one of these abominations, then you defile yourself. That's what it is. It's making yourself dirty, gross, by doing such a thing. Defile not yourselves in any of things, for in all the nations are defiled, which I cast out before you. 25. And the land is defiled, therefore I do visit the iniquity thereof upon it, and the land itself vomiteth out her inhabitants. <laughs> God says, look, when, when I talk about these things, why it makes me want to vomit because they're so gross. But we live in a day and age today in which we have politicians saying, well, we are for the rights of people and we believe in civil rights and we want these people to have their rights. The right to what? The right to sin. The right to get dirty. The right to defile yourself and be gross. When is that a right? I don't understand. I don't understand how people can do these things. And what's worse, I don't understand how politicians can pride themselves upon helping them do these things. What's next? Well, Leviticus chapter 20, verse 11 and 12. And the man that lieth with his father's wife hath uncovered her father's nakedness. Both of them shall surely be put to death. Their blood shall be upon them. Well, a man and his a, a, a mother, uh, uh, yeah, a man and his mother. Uh, verse 12, and if a man lie with his daughter-in-law, both of them shall surely be put to death. So you have incest. Now, incest is gross. A lot of people say, oh, gross, you, you'd marry your sister. Ew. You see how it's, it's something that just is so gross you don't want to even think about it? And your first response is, ew. <laughs> That's an abomination. That's what the Bible calls an abomination. Nowadays, we live in a day and age when they're trying to push on us the idea that it's okay for a man and a boy to have sex. And when they say that, I say, ooh, I want to vomit. No, that's gross. I think it's called NAMBLA or something like that. National uh, Association for Man-Boy Love or something like that. And so all these things that the Bible calls abomination are now being, by the mainstream, uh, made to look like they're okay. And it's liberating to do, and it's the job of the politicians today to help you do these things. What is this? I'll tell you what it is. It's society turning against God and committing abominations. And God says, I hate that. I utterly despise that. And you see, God doesn't put up with things for long. He will eventually judge all those that and what is it it's sin it's sin so I don't want to do it I don't want to have a part of it I don't like it but hey I'm not telling you what you should do I'm just reading to you what God says about it you should decide for yourself I, I talked to a doctor the other day I said doc um, what is the thing that you're seeing the most in your profession what's the biggest disease or what's the What's the worst, the, the thing that's the, 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 there's the most outbreak or whatever? What, what is the thing that you're seeing the most in your practice? And he said, well, he said, since they've allowed gay marriage, he says, the thing that I'm seeing most is colon rectal cancer. He said, there's been an increase of something like, did he say 60% of colon rectal cancer? And he said, all these people are coming in with colon rectal cancer. 
I said, what is colon rectal cancer? He says, they're getting cancer in their rectum. If you know what that is, I don't want to use any other word. I'll use the scientific word. <laughs> but it's because of the sin of sodomy. People are out there practicing sodomy. And because of that, they're getting colon rectal cancer. They're getting cancer, and it's coming from their sin. Well, gee, I wonder why. Could it be because it's dirty, what they're doing? Could it be because it's a disgusting and it's immoral and it's something God says was corrupt and unclean and that you shouldn't do? And could that just be the judgment of God? I mean, you reap what you sow, the Bible says. Could it be that the reason God says don't do these things was because He loves us and doesn't want to see us have problems? Yet when you go against God and you sin against God, then you get sick. So God is an all-loving God. He warns you, don't do these things because you'll get colon rectal cancer. Because you'll die. Because bad things will happen to you. Because demons will torment you. So if you'll just serve me and do what I say, what does the Bible say? God says, my way is easy. My yoke is easy and my burden light. But yet the world wants to sin. The world wants to go against God in the Bible. Let's go to Titus chapter 1. Up until now, I've just read to you nothing but the Old Testament. And it would be very easy for someone to say, well, that's just Old Testament, Mr. Breaker. And so that's just what the Old Testament says, so you don't have to worry about that. <laughs> uh, okay, yeah. And, and I've heard people even argue and say, we're in the New Testament, so we're under grace, so we don't have to listen to that. And they say, so we're under grace, so a man can dress like a woman and a woman dress like a man today, so that's fine. And I think, no, if God said it was bad back then, it's still bad today. He might not allow us to stone one another today like he told them to do back then. But if it's something we shouldn't do back then, we shouldn't do it today. Is that, yeah, is that how it works? Unless the Bible says otherwise. What does the Bible say? Well, I looked up the word abominable or abomination in the New Testament and only found it about three times. And one of them was Titus 1.16. Titus 1.16 says, They profess that they know God, but in works they deny Him. All right? So, those that say they know God, but they deny Him in their works, what does it say? Being abominable and disobedient and unto every good work reprobate. So what does that mean? That means people that are doing things that God called were an abomination, they are denying God and they are disobedient. They're not following God's commandments. They're not doing what God said. So they become what the Bible calls reprobates. Now, what is a reprobate? Let's go to Romans chapter 1 quickly. Because a reprobate is someone who's turned from God and don't want anything to do with God. And by so doing, well, then they become so wicked that they become immoral. Let me show you the mind of an immoral person. I don't have time to read all of Romans chapter 1. I was going to start there in verse 20, but I don't even have time to do that. But read verse 20, 21, 22. Because 22, they, they profess to be wise, <laughs> enlightened, if you will. But look at what they do. They, they don't want to worship God, so they worship, verse 23, their own corruptible man. They worship men. They worship idols. Verse 24, they, they give themselves up to uncleanliness. They say, you know what? I want to be unclean. I want to be gross. I want to be disgusting. I want to be dirty, dirty, dirty. And that's what they become, dirty people, outwardly because of their sin. And then God says He gave them up to their vile affections, verse 26. 27, here you have men with men. Here you have the, the, the sin of sodomy. And it's an error, the verse says. Verse 28, it says God gave them over to a reprobate mind, verse 28. Now verse 29, 30, 31 tells us what's in the mind of these people who commit abominations. These people who don't want God, they don't want morality, they don't want a clean lifestyle, they don't want to live right and do right, what do they like? Well, it says, verse 29, they're filled with all unrighteousness, fornication, wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness, full of envy, murder, what, they want to kill? Debate, deceit, malignity, whisperers, backbiters, haters of God. They go around and say, oh, you're hate speech, you're hate speech, you're hate speech, when they themselves are full of hate. <laughs> and they hate God, they hate good. And it says they're despiteful, proud, boasters, inventors of evil things, disobedient to parents, without understanding, covenant breakers, without natural affection, implacable, unmerciful. 
who knowing the judgment of God that they are worthy of such things or worthy of death, not only do the same, but have pleasure in them that do them. Now, would you agree with me that these people are utterly depraved? Would you agree with me that such people cannot even control themselves? They allow themselves to get in a state where they're so dirty and immoral and so that they can't even do right? Why would we allow these people to rule over us? You know, the majority of the people in certain parties, political parties, are followers of these abominations. Matter of fact, that's part of their platform of their party is, we are for the rights of certain people. And we kick God out. Matter of fact, the Democratic Party, several years ago in their convention, they voted on kicking God out completely of the Democratic Party. They said, we don't want the word God in any of our documents. And they voted, and they said, we don't want that. And they voted God out of the Democratic Party. What have they done? They turn against God. What's the main platform of the Democratic Party? Abortion on demand. Killing your kids. Now, I don't know if the Democrats in the back room are praying to devils and practicing witchcraft. You never know. But I know they're corrupt and immoral and liars. And by the way, let me just say this. So are the Republicans. A lot of people that say they're Republicans are the same as the Democrats. They're in favor of helping people mix their gender and commit sexual sins. That is sad. That is so sad. I don't want to have a part of that. I want to serve God. I want a moral society. I don't want to be a part of something that destroys society. Because when society becomes immoral and completely abominable, then what happens? It's destroyed. So this is the path to destruction. And America's headed that way. Now let me say the last one. I've got to finish. I've already gone long. Leviticus 11.7 And the swine, though he divide the hoof and be cloven-footed, yet he cheweth not the cud, he is unclean to you. Um, you shall eat of all that are in the waters. Whatsoever hath fins and scales in the waters and the seas and the rivers shall you eat of them. And all that have not fins and scales in the seas and in the rivers of the waters. And it says, They shall be an abomination unto you. And they shall be even an abomination unto you. You shall not eat of their flesh, but you shall have their carcasses an abomination. Whatsoever hath no fins nor scales in the waters, that shall be an abomination to you. Alright, so God says, this is the last one, there's a certain diet that they were supposed to eat in the Old Testament. Now what I find interesting about this one is all the other ones are all things that you can do. This abomination is something that you can eat. And all these other ones, God says, these things are an abomination unto Him. That means God hates those things. But in this one, God says, now I want you to look at these certain things, and they be an abomination unto you. What were those things? Well, an example is eating swine, swine's flesh, pig, pork, or eating something without a scale, like lobster. Oh man, I like lobster. Now, all of these other ones, 1 through 6, every one of these in the New Testament are still bad. But this last abomination is the only abomination in the Old Testament that it seems like God does away with in the New Testament. And that is in uh, chapter 10 of Acts. Acts chapter 10, and I'm so far behind right now, I don't have time to read it. So when you get a chance, go to Acts chapter 10, read verses 1 down to verse 15. God comes to Peter and, and tells Peter, look, all these things that I said in the Old Testament that were dirty animals that you can't eat, God says you can now kill and eat. And verse 15, And the voice spake unto him again the second time, What God hath cleansed, that call not thou common. Three times God did that. So these animals in the Old Testament that they were those, the Jews were supposed to look at as unclean, God says they're clean now. I don't know if the blood of Jesus cleansed them or what, but this is the only thing that was an abomination in the Old Testament that God says, now, now you can do. So now in the New Testament, we can eat pork, we can eat bacon, and we do. Now why would God say that they were to be an abomination? Well, because inside of those animals there's... Uh, worms, trichinosis, and, and swine flesh, and other things. And God wants you to be clean. Well, if you eat pork without cooking it completely, then you can get worms inside you. If you get worms inside you, then you're what? You're unclean. You're worm-ridden. <laughs> God doesn't like that. What kind of person has a dog that, that likes to see their dog full of worms? They don't. So God looks at his people, and he says, I want them to be clean. They're my people. You know, my dog. I want my dog to be clean. I don't want them to have worms. 
So this was something that God said in the Old Testament. Now in the New Testament, it's different. And in 1 Timothy 4, verse 4, Paul tells us, For every creature of God is good, and nothing to be refused, if it be received with thanksgiving, for it is sanctified by the word of God and prayer. So we can eat any creature that we so desire today. It's not wrong. So that's the only exception to the rule of things that God calls an abomination. All these other things are still something that God hates today. And there are verses in the New Testament where God says, no, you shouldn't do that, you shouldn't do that, you shouldn't do that. So this would have been the last in our series of the commandments of God. Would have been number seven. What God calls an abomination. So what's an abomination in the Old Testament is still an abomination today in the New Testament unless otherwise stated in the New Testament itself. Now in the Old Testament, when a man or a woman or a nation committed an abomination, it made God angry. And God didn't put up with it very long. Matter of fact, in Ezekiel chapter 20, we read of God saying that His judgment will fall upon those that commit abominations. And all throughout the Old Testament, we see that. We see God's judgment falling upon Israel. And they are being sent as slaves to foreign nations, foreign countries. Ezekiel 20 verse 8 says, But they rebelled against me and would not hearken unto me. They did not every man cast away the abominations of their eyes, neither did they forsake the idols of Egypt. Then I said, I will pour out my fury upon them to accomplish my anger against them in the midst of the land of Egypt. We today are in a day of age of grace. And that ends at the rapture, when Jesus returns at the rapture. Then comes the tribulation. And in the tribulation, the Bible says God's wrath is poured out on the earth. And I wonder if God's wrath is poured out because God just can't take all the abominations that He sees anymore. So He takes out those that are clean, those that are His, those that are washed in the blood, and He says, now I'm going to take out my wrath on this earth. And I'm going to pour it out because you guys are so filthy, so wicked, so ungodly. Let's go to Revelation chapter 17. In Revelation chapter 17, there's a woman who's a great mystery. And many people have tried to say, who is this woman? Well, whoever she is, she's full, verse 4, of filthiness and fornication. And it says she has a gold cup in her hand full of abominations. The world before Jesus returns will be a world full of abominations. And then in verse 5 it says, She is mystery Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and abominations of the earth. So whoever this woman is, and I think she's part, partly the world system, the world system will be full of abominations. And we are seeing in our day before Jesus returns, more and more the governments of this world are getting together and passing laws in favor and helping people to do these sins. And you got to wonder, why? But when you read the Bible, you say, oh, because this, they'd rather serve Satan than God. So God always keeps himself a clean people. He's going to take out his clean people at the rapture, and he's going to leave the dirty people of the devil and then pour out his wrath upon them in the tribulation period. Now I'm going to go to 1 Peter chapter 4. No, I haven't forgotten the gospel. Amen. I'm going to get to the gospel here in a second. But 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 1. For as much then as Christ has suffered for us in the flesh, arm yourselves likewise with the same mind. For he that has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin. That he no longer should live in the rest of his time in the flesh to the lust of men, but to the will of God. The Bible says we should do what God says. We shouldn't do these. You see, this is what the flesh wants. But to be a good Christian, you've got to get saved and then live for Jesus and go against the abominations of the world because the abominations of the world are what the world wants and it says here in verse 3 for the time past of our life may suffice us to have wrought the will of the Gentiles when we walked in lasciviousness lust excess of wine reveling banquetings and abominable idolatries Peter says before we were saved he says we live like the devil and we did abominations we did bad things but now we're saved. We shouldn't do that. Verse 4, Wherein they think it's strange that you run not with them to the same excess of rights, speaking evil of you. You see, the world does this. And when a Christian goes, Man, I can't do that. I can't put on a dress. I can't do sodomy. I can't be in favor of gay marriage. I can't be in favor of, of, of abortion. They look at you and go, What? What are you, crazy? And then they speak evil of you and say, You're the problem. You're the problem. You're the bad guy. No, I'm the guy that's living a holy Christian life, and I just don't want to be dirty and immoral like you. You see? 
And so verse 5 says, Who shall give account to him that is ready to judge the quick and the dead? God is ready to judge. The question is, are you ready for the judgment? Verse 6, For, for this cause was the gospel preached also to them that are dead. And it goes on and on when that happened. But I like the term of the gospel. The Gospel is 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 1 through 4. And the Gospel is all about the blood of Jesus Christ. For it's the blood of Jesus Christ that cleanses from all sin. If you're tired of being sinful and dirty and, and, and immoral and deplorable and unclean, if you're tired of your sins, you ever thought about coming to Jesus for the cleansing power of the blood? You come to Jesus and trust Him as your Savior while He'll cleanse you from all of your sins. And you'll be saved by trusting the Gospel. The Gospel is that Christ died for our sins, was buried and rose again the third day according to the Scriptures. How? By shedding His blood. The blood cleanses from all sins. So I hope this has been a blessing to you. I've not attacked, I've not put down, I've not mocked, I've not ridiculed, I've not said bad things about people. I've simply showed you what the Bible says about abominations. And I've showed you that these things lead to immorality and the destruction of society and unhappiness. If you want a happy life and you want to have a good society, then you need to take heed to what the Bible says. We live in a day and age where parents just don't teach their children anymore. And so children are raised by these kind of people. And that's not the way it should be. We need to get back to the Bible. Because even as a child, you look at these things and you go, Ugh, no, no, I don't want that. So what is it? Are you saved? Have you come to Jesus? Have you trusted Him as your Savior? If you're saved, praise God. How about going out and telling other people how to be saved? And how about telling the world, Look, um, that's an abomination, what you guys want to do. And ask them if they will to come to Jesus. Well, listen, I thank you for watching. We'll see you next time. And I appreciate it. God bless you. And I hope you're having a good new year of 2018. Amen.